Good morning. Please, if you can, turn with me to the book of 1 John. The epistle of John, the first epistle, and uh, chapter number one that has been read to us this morning. We are commencing a new series of exposition and uh, hopefully the Lord giving us blessings and life and strength. We shall consider in depth the book of 1 John, uh, the five chapters therein. Uh, today we shall be looking at the first two verses of John's epistle, the first epistle of the Apostle John. John writes at a time when Christ, his humanity, and deity are under attack. It must be remembered, dear friends, brothers and sisters, that we are now talking about salvation. And we are talking about the savior of humanity, the one in whom we must put our faith and trust and salvation. This is why the words of the Apostle John, as he pens down this letter, are of utmost significance because John is going to exalt Christ and to tell us, really, if we are to talk about this Christ Jesus, who is? Who is the Lord Jesus Christ we're talking about? The one you have sung to. As the Apostle writes, he's writing against a background of false views of Christ Jesus. These things are not new. There's nothing new under the sun. During the days of the Apostle John, there were different groups. There were sects and cults that developed within the church. As indeed, we have cults that are claiming to be part of the Christian faith. Just days, there were people we would call Docetists, and their era would be called Docetism. In other words, this is a group of people that claim to be part of the body of Christ, and this is what they believed about Christ. And this is why the Apostle John is writing. They believed that Jesus was not human, but he only seemed to be human. In other words, he didn't have a real body like we, we have human bodies of blood and flesh. He appeared to have the body like us. It was it's as though they're saying he was some sort of spirit, phantom, some mirage. You would he would you see him physically manifested, but if you critically looked at him, he was not human. He didn't have flesh and blood. He could not suffer like we suffer. And that attacks the work of Christ because we need a savior who is human, fully human, and at the same time fully divine to save us, to be in our place, to take our punishment. But there's yet there's another group of people during those days, and these people were led by a man called Serinthus. Now, this man called Serinthius, his teaching was that Christ was two different people. There was the divine Christ and the human Jesus. And so, the divine Christ that came from heaven came upon the human Christ when Christ was baptized and left him immediately before he suffered on the cross. In other words, the Christ that we know came from God did not die. He left the Jesus. So the, the human Jesus died, but the real Christ never died because he went back to heaven before crucifixion. The Apostle John hears of these things, and he wrestles with them in his time. He is the last man standing because he's the only apostle living these days. The rest are dead. They have been uh, martyred. And these things, the apostle, it pleases the Lord to preserve the life of the Apostle John. 
to deal with these errors. And so as he writes, as, as he responds to them, we then have a more crystallized, a more precipitated doctrine of Christ Jesus. We know him better because then we understand that he's both fully human and fully God. John is going to show those two realities in one person. Two natures, son of God, son of man, fully divine, fully human, sovereign in all ways. This is the intention of the Apostle Paul. If you turn with me to the book of John, where we are, 1, one John, the epistle, just look with me in, in chapter number 2. You see this group of people, what John says about them, before we look at the introduction. Look at what the Apostle John writes concerning these people in verse number 19. The Apostle says, in chapter 2, verse number 19 of the epistle, talking about them, he says... These false teachers, he's even calling them antichrists, they went from us, the apostle writes in verse number 19, they went out from us, why? But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they were not all of us. In those days, the church had people who would claim to know Christ in terms of his humanity better than the Apostle John and the other apostles. They would also claim they know of something of his divinity better than the apostles who were there with him. And they divided themselves. They left the body of Christ. They left the church and they walked away. And we know that they were apostate. Because they disagreed with the doctrine of Christ as was taught by the apostles. Yet these apostles were the very, very people with Christ in person as eyewitnesses. You have seen cults being formed because of Christ Jesus. We know of Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe that Christ Jesus is a created human being, but deified. And so, they are not part of the Christian faith because they believe in a false teaching as regards this man, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not part of us. For your information. But we also have the Mormons. They have a temple in Nairobi, in Burubur. What do they know about Christ? They think of Christ as just an angel, that Christ was a brother of Lucifer. He was an angel. Just some deified angel would be their view. In fact, they say that Christ Jesus was actually born physically by God or of God, the Father. How blasphemous that God had a wife. You see, these things are in Kenya. We have moments. Your children will interact with them, isn't it? <laughs> it's important. Your children will interact with the Jehovah's Witnesses. If not you, then your children. And so it's important that we, we concretize our doctrine of Christ and we catechize our children as regards the doctrine of Christ. It, it, it affects us and it affects our generations to come. Many years, if the Lord tarries, to come from now. And so let's look at what John says about this Christ Jesus so that we ask ourselves, are you sure you know the real Jesus? I know the mirage, the real one. The one that John saw. The one that, that John touched. Let's see what he talks about him. What he says about this man, the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ. John will tell us of two things about Christ. He will tell us that he's verily God. That the real Jesus, Christ that of the, is of the Bible, is verily God. He will go into, he's going to assert that. But secondly, John will assert that that very real Jesus that he's talking about is verifiably man. Two things that John is going to uh, put before us today. That the real Jesus, that of the Bible, the one the apostles talk about, the one the prophets, the prophets would prophesy about, the one that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 53, as regards salvation, is verily God and verifiably man. Divine but human 
at the same time. One person, two natures, not mixing, not being divided, not being separated in that mystic union that you can't describe. It's one man, two natures. Let's see that in the first place. Let's see that the real Jesus is verily God. The apostle writes in verse number one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. This is the Jesus that John knows. He's talking about him. And he's saying in the first place that this real Jesus I'm presenting to you that your joy may be complete, that you may be assured of your salvation is verily God. What is, does he say about Christ in the first place to help us understand the words of John in these two verses? One, John is asserting in these words that the real Jesus Christ coexisted with the Father as his only Son. That the real Jesus of the Bible coexisted with the Father. In other words, they were together. Before incarnation, before he came man, they coexisted with the Father. Look at that phrase in verse number two. John is referring to Christ as the life. Is referring to him as the eternal life. That is how he describes him. And he says, which was with the Father. They were together. And he's taking us back before he became man. They coexisted. As his only son. Look at verse number three. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. He's calling him the Son of God. And he's saying that he was with the Father. They coexisted with the Father. Friends, before we look at those words keenly, I want you to again go back to chapter 2 so that we build a foundation that will help us understand these words. Chapter number 2 and verse number 22 and 23. You'll hear what John says concerning these false teachers again, because that is our background. He says, Who is the liar? Verse 22. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. And verse number 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Again, jump to chapter number 5 and verse number 5. And see what these people are teaching and their false view of Christ. In verse number 5 of chapter 5, he says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is who? The Son of God. There was an outright denial that Christ is the Son of God. They said he can't be because he was man. How can you say a man is the son of God? It was a mystery to them and they, they, they fell into error. As indeed people ask the question, if he was man like us, is it true that he was really the son of God? Because if to say that he is the son of God means that he is God. And that's why the Jews wanted to lynch him, isn't it? Because they, they understood what it means. If you say you are the son of God, it means you are God. You are equal with God. This is the problem we have. So he says he was with the Father. He says he was. The tense. In other words, before incarnation, before he came, became man, he was with the Father. To say that Jesus is the Son of God is to say that he is God. I'm going to show you, because let me ask you some few questions that I show you that that means to say that Jesus is the Son of God means he is the God. Before I say that, let me ask a number of questions. One, at what point, because that is the problem, did Christ become the Son of God? At what point? 
Let me ask the same question differently. Was it at the incarnation that he became the son of God? That when he was born, that is when he became the son of God? Is that what the Bible teaches? Was it at the time of baptism? Because people say that when God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, he made him to be his son at that moment. Is that what the Bible says? Friends, the son of God is not a title to be acquired by Christ Jesus. He did not acquire that title, the son of God. It is not a title. You see, Christ is a title, okay? His name is the son of God and Jesus, okay? But he's called the Christ because that is a title in regards to what he's coming to do, to save. But the Ne the, the, the name the Son of God is the name by which Christ is identified as a part of the Godhead. We have the three persons of the Godhead. We have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit. That is how they are referred to within the Godhead, within the Trinity. Those are their names within the economy of the Trinity. Now, God the Father is referred to as God the Father not because of creation. That is his identity. That is who he is. And God the Son is referred to as God the Son in light of his relationship with God the Father. And therefore, there is also God the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it's referred to as the Spirit of God. That's how they relate within the economy of the Trinity. Let's take this further. How can we then say succinctly that the name, the Son of God, means God? And therefore, that, and if this is to be proved, it means that the, the name, the Son of God, is a name that he has always had in all eternity. They're going to see that in two ways. One, that he has that name by necessity, the name the Son of God, by necessity. Let's look at that first of all. Let's go back to God the Father. In our human experience, one acquires the title Father when he sires a child. Before I gave birth to Junior, I was not a father. I was only a husband, isn't it? But fat people would mostly call me with my name. Hi, Tony. But the moment Junior came, hi, Baba, Baba Tony, Baba Junior. Our, in our case as human beings, we acquire the title. It is not our right. <laughs> you don't go to God and, 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 and force God to make you a father. It is his prerogative to make you a father. If he gives you a child, you acquire the title. Sometimes it can take years to acquire the title. But you acquire that title. But not so with God. God exists necessarily as a father. Because he is not procreated like us. God is the father, not because he gave birth like we go give birth. That's not how it works with God. And you see, in a human concept, that's why we fall into these errors, is because in our minds it is true that for us human beings to have a son or to be called a father, it means the father chronologically comes before the son. I must exist before you exist. So you see, the problem is that we import that understanding to understand God. You see the folly in it? It is our human understanding that we are importing to understand God. Yet it is supposed to be us drawing from God to explain our human experiences. It's not the other way around. And so God is not God because he gave birth like us. He is God because that is his identity. That is his, who he is. By being, God is God the Father. And so, the question that we should ask ourselves is, in all eternity, has God been referred to as God the Father? Has he existed as God the Father? Yes. And why is he called God the Father? Because there's God, the Son. 
That's how the two of them relate. Now, if you agree with me that he has always been called God the Father in all eternity, it means he has always had a, a son in all eternity. That's the implication. Otherwise, at some point, he was not God the Father. That proves that God the Son has always been there in all eternity, by necessity, because of who God the Father is. Secondly, by nature. You have seen by necessity. By nature. Now, again, we human beings are naturally related to our sons through procreation. Our sons share the same nature as us. Today, if you took me to the lab and you took Junior to the lab, those people in the lab will tell you that there's something called DNA, isn't it? And so you will find the DNA and they will tell me, you can't deny this boy is your son, isn't it? <laughs> we have found your DNA in him. By nature. Not just because you are both human. Look at this, these two boys here. Now, there's this, called, this boy called Junior. Another one is sitting next to him. The one next to Junior is human being like Junior, isn't it? By nature. But, now there's something more that connects me with Junior that he doesn't have. DNA. Isn't it? By nature. Now, I want, I'm trying to paint that picture to, to help you understand how God by nature exists as God the Father and God the Son. Now, God the Father and God the Son also are of one substance by nature. We human beings have the nature of man, human flesh. You can tell that this is human. The same applies in terms of nature, in terms of substance. God the Father and God the Son share the same substance, and so they are of one substance. Some other uh, 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 translations would say they are of one subsistence. They are of one nature. Now, let me invite you to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, and verse number 3, so that you see, especially if you have the ESV, it will be beautiful there. If in 1, one John, Hebrews is a few uh, pages to your left. Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 3. You want to see the, the, the description of Christ as regards the Father. That they are of one substance. Now, the writer of Hebrews says, He is, that is Christ Jesus, his Son, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint of his nature. We're talking about nature. By nature, Christ is the exact imprint of the nature of God. And at the same time, he is the radiance of, that, of, the, of the glory of God. Remember, God's glory is not shared. So they're not sharing glory here. It's one glory. Okay? So one is deleting the glory of another. You can't separate them in, in that way. And that's why Christ says many times in the book of John that I and the Father are one. You have seen me. Who have you seen? The Father. You have the same nature. I can't say that about Junior. You've seen me, you've seen Junior. Because Junior is different from me. In as much as we share DNA, isn't it? But we, that is not about God. In, in the economy of the Trinity... The Son is the exact imprint, subsistence, substance, essence with the Father. And so you can tell the, the disciples, you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You don't need to ask the question, where is the Father? By nature. If it is true then, friends, ladies and gentlemen, that him being a son means he's God. And they share the same nature eternally. And by necessity, it's God's son eternally. It means that they are co-eternal. You see the point? They have to be co-eternal. They have to be eternal, both of them, at the same time. For God to remain God the Father, there has to be eternally God the Son. So they have to be co-eternal. Otherwise, you'll break it. Remember, this is very foundational because we believe 
in God, who is God, the triune God. Ours is a God of Trinity, different from other gods. That's why I'm, what I'm saying is very important. And he has existed as Trinity in all eternity. At no point has God existed that the, the, son is, the Father existed first of all, and then the Son came later, and the Spirit came later. In all eternity, all of them have been. And so God in all eternity has existed as triune, as trinity. That should sink in your mind. In all eternity. We didn't have God the Father first, and so God the, the Son came later, and so God the Spirit came later. They all were. And so you hear Christ saying, when he's responding to the question raised as to who he is, he's telling those people referring to Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say I was. He said I am. In other words, I am in the continuum from ages to ages, from the ages past to the ages future, in all the continuum of eternity, I am. So we see him in the, in the book of Exodus as the I am God. And that's why he can be called Adonai. The prophet Isaiah sees him in Isaiah 6. And he's, he's amazed by the glory of Christ before he's incarnate. This is the one we're talking about. But secondly, we have seen that when John says he was with the Father, it means he coexisted with the Father as his son in all eternity. Secondly, John is going to help us understand, as you see that he's verily God, that he pre-existed in eternity past before creation and incarnation. Let's look at his pre-existence then. We have seen his coexistence. Let's see his pre-existence. That the real Christ pre-existed in eternity past before creation and incarnation. In other words, before anything was created and before himself became man, he was. John says in verse number one, that which was from the beginning. He's describing him and he's taking us back yonder. We are looking at the horizon and there's no horizon at all because we are in a purview. We are in a manner of speaking being given a comprehension of the Son of God in a manner that our minds cannot contain. Our minds are finite. John is talking about eternity. And who can understand eternity? I was not there in eternity. Why are you there in eternity? We can't understand. And John is saying that which was from the beginning was from the beginning. Taking us back yonder. You hear the same words in the book of, in the gospel, isn't it? In the gospel it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. You've seen that again here. And the word was God. In the beginning. Even before animals came into existence. Before the stars came. Before you and me came into existence. Before Adam and Eve. Before, this, before the angels of heaven. Before the cherubim and seraph. Before anything was in existence, the sun was. That which was from the beginning is John's contention. This God man, the Lord Jesus Christ, pre existed, he predates anything else. He predates creation because John goes on in that gospel account and he says, And without him was nothing made other than that which he made. And so look at how he describes him in verse number two. He's calling him the life, he refers to him as the life. He is the giver of life to everything that exists as having life and breath. There is nothing existing in this universe of ours, whether in heaven or on earth, that has life apart from the life that it received or she received or he received from Christ Jesus. That is what John is saying. And he's the one who gives eternal life there. Since the, he's the one who gave life at the beginning, he's the one who should give life now in the recreation of man, the fallen man. It, it befits him because he's the one who has life. We need life because we are dead, spiritually speaking. 
The Apostle Paul would contend and say that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. In other words, we need resurrection. We need life to be given unto us. We don't need medicine. We don't need a doctor. We need someone who has life, who will inject life in us, and we will become a living being like Adam in the Garden of Eden. And who is this man? Christ Jesus. The creator of everything. That is what he saw in the book of Colossians. In his supremacy. And he was preeminent in that book because he's the one who gives life. You have life because of Christ this morning. Your children, they are alive because of Christ. And if you need eternal life, because as long as you recognize that you, in and of yourself, you are dead in your sins, and you are looking for life, you look for life in the person and work of Christ Jesus. And that's why it is important to ask the question, are you sure, you know who? The real one, the giver of life. Not a mirage. I told you there are cults. I told you there are false teachings. Even in a real church like this, there can be. I know of a man called T.D. Jakes. I don't know if you know him. His theology of Christ is this way. Let me describe it. He says that God is one. But God only manifests as the Father. Sometimes he manifests as the Son. Sometimes he manifests as the Holy Spirit. In other words, in the Old Testament, God only manifested as God the Father. Now, in the New Testament, he has the same person now manifested as God the Son. And now, when God the Son ascended, now God, the same God is now manifesting as God the Holy Spirit. Far be it that you can have such doctrine in the church. Because look at, again, the, the word that was used in verse number 2 and verse number 3. It says, the life was made manifest, we have seen it and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father. If you say with, it means they're different. That's out of distinction. They're distinguished. They are of the same substance, but they're distinguished as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Clearly distinguished. Different persons, same as sense. How that works out, please don't ask me. So it matters because the moment your doctrine of Christ is false, you will no longer believe in Trinity. Why don't we have Trinity among the Jehovah's Witnesses? Because they don't have the doctrine of God, the Son. Why don't we have God as Trinity among the Mormons? Because they don't believe in what? God the Son being God. You see, the moment you believe that God is, the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Spirit is God, you are saying that there are three in one? That's it. Necessarily, they must, they must be triune. Please proceed with me and look at the second point. We have seen that the real Jesus is verily God. But let's see that the real Jesus is verifiably man. What does the apostle say? Again, let's read the verse. In verse number one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Only human beings talk, don't they? Which we have seen with our eyes, visibility. Human eyes. John is saying, my own human eyes saw him. But doesn't stop there which we looked upon, making it even better, and this is the nail of the coin. This is the last nail on the coffin in that verse, which we have touched with our hands. Human hands touched him. In other words, he was not a phantom or a spirit. See the point? He's verified with man. That's what we're saying. They could verify that he's man. We are going to Paul's selections, probably in the course of the year. And there's a process called verification, isn't it? <laughs> or whether these people actually came and voted, isn't it? <laughs> and the telling process. John is saying I was there. The one I'm talking about is different from the one you know. These false teachers. The one I'm talking about, I heard him speak. He had a mouth to speak. Loud and clear. The one I'm talking about, I saw, I was blessed to see him with my own human eyes. 
And so, in this gospel, it says, and the word became flesh. And it doesn't end there. John says, and dwelt, tabernacled amongst us. What follows it? When you have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son of God. Full of grace and full of truth. The one who was at the bosom of his own father. Because no one has seen God except God. The one at the father's side. He has made the father known. That is John's theology of Christ. John verified these things. And so, first of all, John is telling us that the real Christ Jesus was manifested in a visible, tangible, physical, human body to the eyewitnesses. John is telling them, they are, you know, the false teachers, <laughs> you don't have the authority to talk about the person you don't know. That's the point. You can't talk about the person you don't know. The best person to talk about days in this room is Emmanuel. Isn't it? You have seen her? Have you not touched her? We usually just got her, isn't it? But for you, you have touched her, isn't it? That's the point. You know that she's not a phantom, isn't it? She's not a spirit. Have you tested? She has been cut by a knife in the kitchen and she has bled, isn't it? That's what John is saying. I have verified these things with my own human faculties, with my own senses. He was. And so he's responding to the people who believed that Christ only appeared to be human. He's telling them, I was with him. It, does, it didn't end there. I touched him. I saw him. I heard him speak. And the words I'm writing to you are his words. Look at verse 5. He says concerning the words that he had from him. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. <laughs> they heard him speak. They didn't read in tales, eh? in narratives, in novels. You know, you can know William Shakespeare because of the novels he wrote, isn't it? No. He said, I heard him. I heard him speak. These things I'm talking about, I heard him. John was even there when Christ was praying for them before his crucifixion. He was there. By God's grace, he was allowed as a human being to eavesdrop the conversation between the father and the son. When the, the father was, the son was praying. And they had, you know, you can imagine how privileged John was. You can hear someone praying for you. <laughs> he had the son praying for him. And he says in this gospel that thankfully, the one he had to pray did not just pray for them alone as these apostles. They, he only prayed for us. The one who would let us believe through them. And that's why we are, we are, we are here today. We have believed because he prayed for us. Now, let's close quickly. Let's close quickly then. We know that he's really a human being. In history, he was a real man in history. He came from heaven, but he became man, human, a historical figure who could be verified. Quickly, in terms of what we have seen in this uh, first two verses. One, we as a church, believers, the people living in the 21st century of postmodernity, people who think they're bright, they're wise, we must tread carefully whenever there is an intersection between the divine and the human, lest we fall into error. Let me repeat. We must tread carefully whenever there is an intersection between the divine and the human in whatever way represented in the Bible. Let me explain that quickly. There are cases in the Bible where the human intersects with the, the divine. For example, the incarnation of Christ. Him becoming man, he's both God and both man. Another example of intersection is as regards the authorship of scripture. See the point? Who wrote the Bible? Children would answer that question. Who wrote the Bible? Holy men who are taught by the Spirit of God, they say in the Catechism. You see, there's both. It, is, it was men writing, but it was God giving the revelation. There's an intersection there between the divine and the, the human. 
another inter intersection, is as regards the God's sovereignty in salvation and sanctification and the human responsibility. God is working in us, but you're also working. God is the one sovereign in our salvation, but you must believe. Whenever there's an intersection between the divine and the human, we must tread carefully. Because if you fall on either of the sides, you are already in error. If you emphasize the human nature of Christ and forget the divine, error. If you emphasize only the, 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 the divine and forget the human, error. If you say that the Bible was written and God just dictated because God used the experience of this man. It was not a dictation, okay? <laughs> he used the real human beings in real time with real experiences. There's a combination of the both, the concurrence. In our salvation, you must believe but God is sovereign in salvation. <laughs> As to how they marry, don't ask me. We leave it that way. People have fallen into those errors where there seems to be intercession because they want to marry them. Anytime you marry them, you either de deny one, distort them, or you dissolve them. Those three things is either you're going to deny one, distort their two, or dissolve them. So tread carefully whenever there's that intersection between the divine and the human. And so we must hold both in balance. How is one saved? He must believe, isn't it? Yet, God is sovereign in salvation. You give both answers. Who wrote the Bible? Holy men who are, ta who are taught by the Spirit. Who was Christ? He was fully man and fully God. We hold both in tandem, in balance. The moment you emphasize one and leave another one, error. Hear what the Chalcedonian Creed said as they catalyzed, as they precipitated the doctrine of Christ in the, the early centuries so that this thing was not understood. Because even in their own time, the doctrine was, of Christ was challenged. This is what they said in the Creed. I quote, Christ is acknowledged in two natures which undergo no confusion, no change, no division, no separation, at no point was there difference between the natures taken away through the union, but rather the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single person and a single subsistent being. He is not parted or divided into two persons, but is one and the same only begotten Son, God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ. End of quote. It can't get better than that. It, our brother taught us about the, the creeds, the confessions, the catechisms. Why? If you begin to develop your own Christology right now, not of Christ, you will fall into error. You need history. What the church has believed in all the ages. You need the historicity of these doctrines. It goes back to what the apostles believed. But secondly and lastly, as the God man, you have seen that he's fully God and fully man. He gives eternal life to those who believe in him. Remember he has been referred to as the eternal life in verse number two. John calls him deliberately the life He's talking about him. He's calling him the eternal life. Because as the God-man, the person who is, uh, you know, of two natures and of one person, is the one who communicates life to the dead. The way he communicated life at the beginning of creation, in the notice of, Ab of Adam. He continues to do so. To those who are spiritually dead. If you're in this room today and you realize that you are spiritually dead, you are not a believer, you have nothing to do with God, you have never put your trust in God and the salvation, this is the good news that I have for you. That Christ is here referred to as the eternal life. That if you believe in the real Jesus, you have eternal life. Because John himself is very clear in our memory verse. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him 
should not perish, but should have what? Eternal life. It is God who gave them. That it is through him that we have life. Implication. Anyone who does not believe in Christ Jesus has no life here on earth and eternity. It doesn't matter your religion. If you hear a Muslim denying Christ that is not God, the implication is that they are headlong into hell. It's, there's no in between friends. We can't waver as regards salvation. There's only one way of salvation. And that's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not alive, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Your child back at home or here, your uncle, your grandmother, anybody associated with you will have no life eternally unless they put their faith in Christ, including you. Think about that. Do you need life? I, I, I wish this boy was born again today. That's my prayer. That he, because who would want to see him go to hell? Do you want to go to hell yourself? But there's, there's life here, eternal. Not just life. It's described as eternal life. Won't you need eternal life today? Isn't that your desire? I wish that is, would be the desire of all of us in this room today. But it's a simple thing. Believe in Christ Jesus and you will be saved. But lastly, Turn with me to the book of John, the same where we are, chapter 5. 1 John, where we are. If you're a believer, what is your hope as a believer? 5.13. 1 John 5.13, where we are, in chapter 5. This is a parting shot for a believer here. I hope this gives you hope. I hope this encourages your heart, because you have believed in the real Jesus. This is your hope, verse 13, of 1 John 5, 13. John is saying to believers, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have what? Eternal life. That you may know. <laughs> Assurance. You don't wait to be assured when you go to heaven. You're already assured. It's a knowledge that you already know. So if someone comes to you and tells you, are you going to heaven? What should be the answer? Yes. yes. A bold yes. I'm, I'm waiting to be beatified. The saints being beatified. You see, the Catholics would say that, isn't it? They'll, they'll pronounce you a saint when you die. Many years back, uh, after. No, you know. Here on earth, before you go, <laughs> it is cash and carry. <laughs> it is done here on earth, before you go to heaven. You know, as you're dying, on your deathbed, you know that I'm going to hell or heaven. You shall know, because you believe. That is the hope of a believer. Don't wait to know later. Be assured. <laughs> that should make you happy and joyous. Remember what John says. I write these things to you, that your joy may be what? Complete. Do you have complete joy in Christ Jesus? That you have life. Oh, what is more precious than eternal, than eternal life? That even if you die today, there's life in heaven for you. Eternally. May the Lord bless that in your heart. And may you be rejoiced as a believer for the glory of Christ. Amen.